Hi everyone and welcome to this webinar from RCVS Knowledge. We're going to talk today about the um, very serious and concerning problem of infection control and biosecurity during COVID-19. I know this is something that lots of practices would like some help with and hopefully we'll be able to, to give you some pointers. So I'm very lucky to be joined today by Alan Radford and Tim Nuttall. Alan graduated from Liverpool in 1993 with degrees in veterinary science and molecular biology and in 1998 a PhD in virology. So no better person to talk to us about the virus and, and what we're dealing with. Alan also has established the uh, help to establish the Small Animal Veterinary Surveillance Network known to most of us as SAVSnet which collects large volumes of companion animal electronic health data from veterinary practitioners and diagnostic labs across the UK. Tim is an RCVS recognised specialist in veterinary dermatology and head of the dermatology service at the University of Edinburgh. He has a particular interest in antimicrobial stewardship and infection control and has worked with the Bella Moss Foundation, the Scottish Veterinary Antimicrobial Stewardship Group, RCVS Knowledge and others to develop policies and guidelines. He's now, like a lot of us, working from home and is learning what his two cats get up to all day. So we're very lucky to be joined by two such eminent speakers to help us through this minefield area of infection control during the current problems. Well, who am I then? Uh, my name is Pam Mosdale. I'm chair of the RCVS Knowledge Quality Improvement Advisory Board. I'm also lead assessor of practice standards scheme at the Royal College, and I'm also a Bella Moss clinical advisor. I'm a veterinary surgeon who's been in first opinion practice all my career. So RCVS Knowledge have brought this webinar to you. RCVS Knowledge's mission is to advance the quality of veterinary care for the benefit of animals, the public and society. They do this by championing the use of evidence-based approach to veterinary medicine, and inspiring a culture of quality improvement. Although we have our CVS in our name, we are a separate organisation to the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. We have resources on, on evidence-based medicine and on quality improvement in practice, which are available um, on our website to the whole profession. In this webinar, we're going to cover, first of all, Alan is going to talk to us about coronavirus, know your enemy. Again, looking at the evidence base and understanding the science can help us to understand what we should be doing. And then Tim will talk about infection control in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic and practical things you can do in your own practices. And then at the end, I'll ask them some questions that you have submitted. Okay, um, coronaviruses are, um, um, they're viruses, they're obligate intracellular parasites, which means they need a host cell to replicate different to most um, bacteria and fungi and things like that. Um, they need a host cell to, uh, to divide. Um, this uh, cartoon here shows you the um, most of the full range of veterinary um, viruses of importance. Um, and this is where um, the coronaviruses fit in. And the important things that I want to um, highlight on um, this particular figure are that coronaviruses have an RNA genome and they are enveloped. Both of those have important implications for their biology, which I'll talk through on the next slide. So the first thing to say is it has an RNA genome coronaviruses have an RNA genome. The important thing about RNA is that it's, it's very unstable, um, it mutates very quickly, uh, and it allows viruses with RNA genomes to evolve very quickly. And that explains in a nutshell why we're having uh, the problem that we, uh, that we do with um, this new uh, coronavirus in humans. It's the mutation of the RNA genome uh, that's allowed it probably to arrive in humans. Um, the next thing, it has a lipid envelope. That's um, uh, really, really good news, actually. Uh, the lipid envelope is derived from the host cell and the virus uh, uh, exited. Um, it's essential for infectivity. 
but being derived from lipid, it's actually quite um, fragile and means that coronaviruses are generally short-lived in the environment and relatively susceptible to soap and alcohol-based disinfectants. And it's why um, this sort of hand-washing mantra, this hand-washing campaign is so prominent uh, for uh, the control of transmission between humans. Uh, we all know we should be washing our hands um, more frequently. Um, the last thing, uh, the envelope is decorated with um, viral proteins, uh, um, which you can see in this electron micrograph here. And when that was first seen, um, the virologists thought it looked like a crown or a corona, and that's where the name of these viruses come from, the coronaviruses. Um, what I'm showing here now is a, um, a family tree of coronaviruses, at least as it was um, uh, a few years ago. And I wanted to make the point that there are a lot of very well-known veterinary viruses um, in, in uh, the coronavirus family, whether you work on uh, cats, so things like um, the, the cause of FIP up here, uh, whether you work on um, pigs, lots of uh, respiratory and enteric uh, viruses in pigs. Uh, there's cattle um, coronaviruses and equine coronaviruses, and then down here, probably the other prominent uh, veterinary coronaviruses, uh, infectious bronchitis virus um, of, of chickens. So um, as vets, um, vet nurses, we're all very familiar with, uh, with coronaviruses and, and they're a common part of, um, of veterinary practice. If we look at the human viruses, uh, again, this is from a couple of years ago, so there, there are quite a few, um, generally associated with mild signs like, uh, like the common cold. And um, then I'll draw your attention to this one here, uh, which uh, was a new kid on the block in 2002 and the cause of the, um, the first SARS um, outbreak in people. Uh, this one was controlled really um, effectively through a worldwide campaign of identifying infected people and, um, and minimizing their, their contact. And luckily it wasn't so transmissible, although it was perhaps um, uh, more virulent, it was less transmissible and we managed to eradicate it from the human population. Uh, the pictures of bats is to make the point that bats have a lot of coronaviruses um, and uh, it, it, they became prominent. We didn't really care about bat coronaviruses, to be honest, until uh, it was found that the last SARS um, epidemic um, it, uh, emerged from a virus of bats. And you can see that here. Uh, these two viruses are very, very closely related. Um, and to cut a long story short, it's believed that, that bats are reservoirs of coronaviruses that occasionally spill out into humans. You can see that here. In general, however, uh, the other important message from, from this is that the veterinary viruses are, are really, uh, the non-bat veterinary viruses, if you like, uh, are very distinct from the um, human coronaviruses. <clears throat> so uh, we should be very careful when we talk about coronaviruses in animals that we make the point that yes, a cat may have a coronavirus, but it is no way related uh, to the coronavirus um, that we're all worried about at the moment. Um, they're really very distinct and you can see that from this long branch length here. So what's changed? Um, well, if we zoom in on this little group here, um, um, what happened uh, towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year um, was the emergence of this uh, of a new virus in the human population, which ultimately became SARS coronavirus 2. Again, very closely related to bat viruses. This is a um, believed to be, not proven yet, but a believed to be another spillover event, probably from bats, possibly by uh, via an intermediate reservoir. Um, it's not the same as the first SARS um, outbreak. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 is 80% the same or 20% different to that virus. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 is 96% similar or 4% different to, to this bat virus. So again, um, that's what we think is happening. No, no other animal link um, that we're aware of. So 
that's where it came from. What about uh, SARS coronavirus 2 um, and animals? There are two reasons to think about, I put pets here, but we can think about animals, um, veterinary species more broadly. Uh, the first question is, can they be infected? Well, uh, as a scientist, it's very hard uh, to say something uh, hasn't happened or will never happen. Um, but the current evidence um, says the risk is, um, I put here absolutely tiny, negligible. Um, there has been, um, that I'm aware of, um, a single case where a dog that was living with an infected person also tested positive for the virus. This is for the virus. Um, the dog wasn't sick, it didn't develop antibodies, and um, the suggestion was that the dog probably wasn't infected, more had uh, virus on it. And, and that brings us to the second uh, concern with animals, not infection itself, but I've called it here contamination. But clearly, if an animal's living or in close contact with an infected person, uh, the animal will get virus on them especially um, perhaps um, particularly with pet, pet animals, um, just in the same way that the uh, infected person's phone or door handles in their house uh, would have virus on them, so too their, their pet. And, and in that sense, uh, animals can be considered fomites, that they, um, uh, animals living with infected people can be considered as, um, as fomites. And, and this is the concern, this virus could infect other people. It, and we'd call that indirect transmission. So what should we um, do about uh, that? Well, firstly, um, we're all being told all the time we should be reduce, reducing handling of all fomites and we should include animals in that. So one simple thing to uh, consider in practice is consider what cases to postpone. Uh, for example, do you need to vaccinate animals as frequently as you used to? Um, and there's some really nice uh, guidance here from WSABA. If you want to have a look at that, I found that quite useful. Um, when we do handle fomites, including uh, animals that may be infected, we can wear um, gloves. Uh, and that makes sense. And Tim's going to talk much more about that in a moment. We certainly should be asking um, owners of, of animals that we're seeing uh, whether the animal comes from a house that has suspect disease, COVID-19 disease. And if an animal has to be seen from such a home, then uh, we really have to be thinking very carefully about separation, um, disinfection, biosecurity. But again, Tim's going to talk more about that in a moment. Um, I found this a really useful um, uh, site for information about dealing with animals from um, potentially infected homes. So that's it, not infection at the moment, could change, but not infection, um, and, uh, but absolutely definitely contamination and fomite risk. So the take home on the virology is uh, they rapidly mutate, that's why we're having the conversation we're having today. Uh, the envelope is really good news, it means um, that it's a relatively fragile virus and we can uh, therefore focus on, on sensible things like hand washing and um, use of detergents and disinfection uh, within the practice and the environment. Um, if we do talk about animal coronaviruses, then we should try and let's try and be specific so we don't confuse people. Um, let's not talk about coronavirus in cats. Let's talk about feline enteric coronavirus or feline infectious peritonitis virus, we could call it as well. Um, and um, well, just for interest, bats are an important reservoir. And I'm sure when this is all over, um, and things are a bit more back to normal, we'll be uh, reviewing bats and their role as a source of coronavirus infections to people and other animals. And that's all I wanted to say. Right. Um, thank you very much uh, to Alan for um, that really useful uh, introduction to coronaviruses. And I'd like to thank RCVS Knowledge for putting together uh, this presentation and all the really useful information that's going on the RCVS Knowledge site. Um, and I guess uh, never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I would be giving this presentation and nor is it the presentation that anybody um, would want to give. And this is the importance of, of what we're doing. Um, this virus seems to be uh, incredibly contagious and spreading very, very easily between people. 
and a lot of people are going to get infected. And if that happens in a short period of time, our health service will become overwhelmed, uh, which means not only a lot of people might die of coronavirus, but a lot of people who need urgent life-saving therapy um, in other fields won't get it simply because there won't be the beds or medical staff available to help them. So we all have to do what we can um, to contribute to this flattening of the curve so that the, um, the morbidity of this virus in a number of cases become uh, it, it remains manageable um, and that as many people survive um, through to the other end of this as, as, uh, as, as possible. And what we'll be going through uh, 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 in this presentation is really what we can do as vets to, to help this as part of the wider community efforts. And it's um, unreasonable to say that we can just shut down. Um, we, are, uh, we provide an essential service um, and although we should all be reducing ca our caseload to what is essential, we will still be seeing uh, animals. Uh, and obviously then uh, meeting those animals and meeting those owners um, not only um, uh, places a risk to us and our staff, um, but also we have to be mindful that um, veterinary practices could wind up being uh, hubs for dissemination of this virus amongst the wider community. And again, whatever we can do to reduce that will contribute to this flattening of the curve. And this is where the infection control becomes very important. Uh, and I don't think there's ever been a time that I can remember um, where an immediate uh, and effective infection control has become so important, not just in veterinary practice, but throughout the entire uh, community. And this is something that I and others have been working on uh, very hard for the last few years. And we do know that a lot of bacteria um, are very good at colonizing um, veterinary practices and veterinary premises and equipment where these can get passed on between people and between patients. Um, but we also know that this is now true of coronavirus. Um, and coronavirus is, uh, is easily transferred onto fomites. Uh, the main uh, routes of transmission are either direct contamination uh, from an infected person if you're very close to them, um, but also through fomites and contamination on surfaces. And under certain circumstances on hard surfaces, um, and, uh, and these would be ideal conditions of temperature and humidity, which more or less reflect what we have indoors, um, the coronavirus here can survive, or COVID-19 uh, is estimated that it can survive for several hours and un under certain circumstances, particularly in droplets, it can survive for several days. So we have to really think very hard about the challenge of fomites and, and how we use infection control to manage that. And this was data that was um, run by the Royal Veterinary College and the Bella Moss Foundation and led out by Anna Mateus and is a little bit old now in 2014. Um, and the good news there was that um, uh, more than 50% of the practices uh, and vets that were questioned uh, were aware of written protocols for infection control, but this still meant there was a considerable number that, that weren't. And this really now has to get turned around very, very quickly. Now there is going to be a second uh, webinar that is going to look at uh, infection control in more detail. And what I want to do in this session is really just um, bring out um, and highlight the immediate points that we need to adopt as a matter of urgency uh, in face of this COVID-19 um, pandemic. And I'll be looking, picking out some areas on infection control, um, concentrating on hand washing, cleaning um, and then how to manage social distancing in, in practice and I think it's very important that these, these should be written um, because everybody now needs very clear um, and very effective and unambiguous advice and in particular we have to remember that as people fall sick or become sequestered um, we may have members of staff doing jobs that they are not used to doing and working in teams that they may not be used to. And so this advice needs to be very clear so that it can be immediately and effectively implemented. And again, uh, this is probably best put together by an infection control team, either within the practice or if you're working in a practice group or, or a corporate practice, um, then uh, it could be um, 
spread out throughout that group. And I know that some um, uh, practice groups uh, have shared their uh, infection control advice that RCVS Knowledge is going to be putting onto the website, and we're very grateful for that. And I think at this stage, um, there are really two things. So there's the background baseline level of everyday infection control, and then there are the immediate tasks and changes to um, procedure that we need to adopt um, in the face of this COVID-19 um, pandemic to make sure uh, that we are uh, not only um, maintaining our general standards of, of protection, because remember things like bacteria and antimicrobial resistance bacteria and canine parvovirus and all these other things are not going to suddenly go away, um, but we, we are cognizant of the risk to human health from COVID-19. And using um, simple infographics uh, and posters is very, very useful. And these can be put up both in the uh, sort of back room areas of a practice as well as the client um, facing areas. And these are ones that I, I got to by going on to the BSAVA COVID-19 uh, website and then followed a link through to the World Health Organization. These have been produced by their Western Pacific region. And it's just very good, very simple take home messages to reinforce to people what they should be doing. Uh, there's one thing on the right hand poster there, it is talking about a one meter um, social distancing um, gap. And I think the most uh, things are changing very, very quickly. Um, I think since this poster was produced, um, the advice really now is to look at a two meter gap. And as Alan um, pointed out, our one big advantage here is that the coronavirus is an enveloped virus and is therefore very vulnerable to routine um, detergents and, and alcohol-based disinfectants, among, among others. And so um, it is actually very reasonably simple to remove this from um, fomites and hand touch. Uh, surfaces but really uh, um, I just want to reinforce the message that's coming out from everybody about hand washing and it is basically just wash your hands as often as you can and this works. Um, now people with um, pre-existing dermatitis so contact uh, dermatitis or eczema um, may need will probably need to moisturize their hands after washing and possibly even carry a little uh, pack of moisturizer around with them because this constant washing will dry out your hands which might lead to a flare and inflammation um, and remember then that can increase bacterial adherence to the skin which may have infection control implications for um, practice work. Now these are the five moments for hand hygiene which have been adapted from the World Health Organization's uh, advice for managing um, infection control within hospital and other healthcare settings and we've just basically done the same thing but put a, a put some animals in there um, and all of these still hold true because again all of the infection control challenges that we faced um, back at you know in January when corona was still a beer um, are still there but really we now need to just up the ante on this and be hand washing uh, at every opportunity and certainly before and after every task that we're doing um, and I really think again although normally infection control really majors on clinical areas this is something we now need to be rolling out throughout the practice teams whether clinical or not. These are uh, the hand wash and hand rub posters that we use uh, at the Dick Vet. We, we have these um, posters up um, just about by every hand wash and hand disinfection site and we've been rolling out more of these um, uh, recently. Uh, we use these for teaching as well so if you um, have a, a smartphone with a, a quick uh, release code uh, reader on you can scan uh, the QR code in the um, corner and that will take you to uh, a narrated video which we use for our undergraduate teaching but is a very quick way to upskill everybody in the practice on that and again these are on the um, RCVS knowledge website we're very happy to, to share these um, I'm, I'm more than happy for people to put these up in their practices as well if that is going to be useful um, but I, again if you're going to put posters up should have mentioned this earlier please laminate them or protect them in some way so that it doesn't interfere with cleaning 
And again, this is a time to reinforce the message that anything that is going to get in the way of an efficient and effective uh, hand washing and hand disinfection uh, protocol now needs to go. And I know people can get uh, very fond of their watches and rings and bangles and so on, but um, it now has to go. There is, there is no excuse. There is a, a, not just an animal health, but a public health imperative to this. Now, in the middle there, I've listed the, um, um, uh, when we would normally, the situations we would normally wear gloves. And, and these were basically whenever we had to up the ante on infection control. So either the animal was at a greater contagion risk to us or we were at a greater contagion risk because the animal was um, vulnerable in some way. Um, and really now I think we ought to be wearing gloves whenever um, we are um, handling an animal or potentially meeting uh, an animal owner. But the really two take home messages here is that, that um, gloves are not a substitute um, for hand washing. Um, they are an additional protection to this. Um, they do not make us uh, in, invincible or, or immortal. And uh, gloves, once you have performed the task or handled an animal, whatever you've done, it then becomes a potential fomite. So they must be disposed of carefully and changed. Now, um, other bits and pieces that we tend to forget about, because even if we're really focused on our hands, uh, we do have a tendency to forget about other other equipment. Um, and this could be in, include anything we use with an animal or anything that we're repeatedly touching with our hands. And this does include equipment pouches, uh, stethoscopes. I mean, there was a study a couple of years ago showing that in hospitals, stethoscopes were uh, carried more bacteria than, than people's hands because we just didn't think about cleaning them. And in the NHS has been a huge uh, program of, of getting clinicians and nurses to um, remember to clean their stethoscopes between patients as well as their hands. But also fob watches, we use smartphones, tablets a lot now, particularly as we're moving to paperless practices. Uh, so there's quite a, um, a few videos and a, a very useful guide on the BBC website about how to effectively clean smartphones uh, and tablets during the um, during this um, pandemic. Um, uh, otoscopes, uh, ophthalmoscopes would be would be other pieces of kit as well. Now, where possible, um, it would be ideal if uh, particularly vets that are going out. Um, to see animals, so equine vets and farm vets had their own selection of equipment and these weren't shared um, uh, between individuals, so everything's nicely sequestered, um, but if, if they have to be, they need to be very carefully cleaned and disinfected. Again, I, I think, um, as Alan said, and I'll talk a little bit about this later on, um, we, we um, have to regard an animal um, as a fomite, um, but also we have to regard anything that animal is coming in with as a potential fomite as well. Now, the animal we can't do anything about. It's, it, you know, we swore an oath um, to, to look after the, the health and welfare of any animals committed to our care. Um, and that, you know, that's the job we've signed up to do. But we can minimize this risk by just not admitting anything into the practice that, um, that is a potential additional fomite. So I think nothing now. Uh, aside from the animal should come in and if we do need to admit uh, animals then they should all the leads and other equipment should be uh, clean allocated that animal for the duration of its stay um, and then disposed of or cleaned and disinfected um, before uh, it, it's it's used again Now, dogs it's reasonably easy we can quickly swap over leads outside the practice um, Cats um, and other exotic species, perhaps a little bit more difficult, but I think again, outside the practice, the carrier can be taken uh, off the owner. As soon as is practical, the animal can be moved into a carrier that belongs to the practice. Um, both are wiped down to remove uh, any potential virus contamination, and then the basket or so on could be returned back to the owner. And I think this is a, a, a good opportunity to reinforce messages about cleaning protocols. Um, and again, this is something that will be covered a little bit later in the, um, in the second um, set of presentations. But the, 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 these need to be written down 
uh, they need to be uh, clearly indicated in the room that they're relevant to. Remember people that are doing this, it may not have been their day job up to this point. Um, they just need to be routine because visual cleanliness, when we're talking about any microorganism, but particularly viruses, is utterly misleading. A, a visually clean surface can be heavily contaminated and therefore using checklists to um, identify um, and tick off when things have been cleaned so everybody's got a very good idea of what, what's been done and what needs to be done uh, are very very useful and I think anywhere where you can shut areas down just to make things easier is a really good idea so um, for example within the university hospital now uh, as we've moved to essential working only, rooms that are not being used have been cleaned, locked and, and taped off um, just so that we, we know the areas that are in use and it reduces the workload. Um, and lastly, remember that as one of my farm colleagues likes to say, you can't disinfect shit. Um, so, you know, that it really is about cleaning and then disinfecting. But with the good news that COVID-19 is, is pretty vulnerable um, to most uh, detergents and uh, disinfectants. Um, I think it's a good opportunity. Um, certainly it was a bit of a, uh, an opportunity for us to do a big spring clean and get rid of all that unnecessary mess that you've been meaning to, uh, to, to remove for ages. Uh, but in particular, anything that can't be cleaned and disinfected needs to go or be sequestered away. So this might include, for example, removing or taping off displays within waiting rooms so that they, they, they um, you're just removing the touch risk from there. It's a good opportunity to think about installing uh, washable keyboards wherever they're being used and in clinical areas. Um, it, it, you could use these keyboard gloves um, or uh, you can wrap um, keyboards in cling film. It's pretty fragile that's the only disadvantage so as soon as it becomes torn um, it would need to be um, removed and, and replaced and again just have a really good think in terms of cleaning protocols about potential hand touch sites that we don't necessarily think of uh, as being a particular infection control risk. I think uh, uniforms worn um, in the practice or on site for, for um, equine and farm vets, a really good idea. It, it is potentially uh, important that this is rolled out to any um, non-clinical staff who might uh, be, uh, need to be working within the practice as well. Um, and that these should be um, uh, cleaned and disinfected after use. And we'll talk a little bit more about PPE uh, later on. Uh, again, very important that there's a one-way movement of potentially contaminated clothing um, so that there's no cross-contamination with, with, with that is clean. And I think it's really important uh, both for COVID-19 control, but also I think to send um, a reassuring message to members of the public that clinical clothing is, is now not worn um, outside of the, uh, the clinical environment. And then, as I said earlier, um, as vets, um, we have a very important role to play in the health of the nation's animals, but we have to do this safely. And we cannot say we're just not seeing anybody. So we have to do what we can to do this as safely as possible. And this basically means uh, two things, really. One is maintaining the social distancing rules, which is now um, at about two metres. Um, um, uh, and then uh, maintaining hygiene and, and hand hygiene. So things that uh, people can do and establish protocols for their practice. And I think the big first thing is we're down to essential cases only, do whatever we can remotely, um, so long as that doesn't interfere with the animal's welfare or our, our CVS oath. And the BVA has produced a very good uh, and very succinct set of guidelines. Um, it's only about Two, two or three pages long. Um, it's going to go on the RCVS knowledge site. You can also get this off the BVA site. Uh, and that covers um, some really key messages about um, handling patients in small animal uh, uh, farm and equine practice. And some, some key points are um, appointments uh, should be made remotely. Um, 
and, and, and again, anybody who does not need to be in the practice should not should be self should be working from home, and that could include account staff and reception staff, for example. The first question is to ask about the owner's health um, or the health of the, any of their in contacts. Um, and if there are concerns either from a known COVID-19 household or a suspect one, then greater precautions need to be taken. But do please remember that um, not being ill does not mean you're not infected with this virus. Um, so, it, 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 you know, don't be complacent with that. Um, uh, uh, owners basically shouldn't come into the practice um, unless it's absolutely necessary. So consultations can be carried out by phone, um, by email. Um, it, um, it's entirely possible for the owner to remain in a car, uh, in the car park, and then have a phone conversation with the vet. Um, all of this just minimizes the time with people in where you're in potential contact with them in, in, in the same airspace. And then remember just to minimize any risk of taking additional fomites into the practice. Um, but uh, so, um, but the, do record everything. So again, if there's verbal consent, um, make sure that's recorded somewhere or consider the use of an online consent form. Um, I think uh, the, it, it, unless there is a pressing um, clinical need, um, once that history has been taken, then animals can be admitted straight from the, the car and avoid the waiting room um, wh wherever possible. Uh, a, a lead can be given uh, to, uh, uh, as I said earlier, to slip onto the animal and bring them in, or you might just have to um, take the basket into the practice and then exchange the animal and take the basket back out again, making sure that you're absolutely staying uh, outside of the social distancing uh, area, um, maintaining social distancing, sorry, wherever possible and wearing gloves when we do that. Um, the, there should be uh, one uh, client or owner per animal or consultation and again if you're visiting uh, off-site premises so stables or a farm restrict the visit restrict yourself to only to those areas that are absolutely necessary for the clinical job to do wear gloves at all times and then uh, think about immediately disinfecting any hand touch sites or equipment after use and that would include regular disinfection of a vehicle so steering wheels gear sticks um, handles and so on and then um, the, the there are two issues around um, transmission here. Now, one is direct transmission, and so that is where there is a risk from uh, the uh, owner directly to um, to the veterinary staff, um, or within the pra or between individuals within the same practice. And then there is the issue of the animal acting as a fomite. So the animal is very unlikely to to cough or sneeze onto you and spread the virus that way. But it could act as a fomite that you pick pick up. So I think gloves, uh, the, the, the basic minimum would be gloves, a hand washing, and then disinfection, immediate disinfection of hand touch sites and equipment, and resisting um, uh, as much as we can, the temptation to touch my face. And it's only start, since I've started thinking about this, if I, if I realized uh, how much we just do this unconsciously. I think um, full PPE, um, and I think I think there is a, a two issues around this. One is that um, a lot of PPE could wind up now. We could wind up running out of it in veterinary practice because uh, it is going to be prioritised for use in um, uh, in human health, and and rightly so. So I think we have to be sensible about this. Um, ration what we have and only use it where absolutely necessary. So for example, this could be where we wind up having to see an animal from a known um, COVID-19 uh, um, positive house or potentially even go and pick up an animal from an, a known or suspected COVID-19 uh, house. Um, and I think there uh, we could upscale to an apron. I think face and eye protection would only be necessary from the animal where there is a, a splash risk. Uh, again, if we had to go into 
premises where where there are known uh, it's a known positive household or a suspected one then and it, you know that will be a very rare uh, occurrence and if there was no alternative but I think full PPE could be considered at that point. Um, practical social distancing you can see my two colleagues there um, holding an animal uh, I mean to be fair that was uh, taken before the pandemic started uh, but within veterinary clinical work uh, it, it is difficult to stay two meters apart so what we're trying to do very much is use open areas um, uh, and make sure that they're well ventilated and then what we've done is um, is divided our team sequestered our teams um, into the or, or sequestered our staff into these non overlapping teams so first off it's essential staff only and then second they're working on this team base um, and they the the different teams have no on-site or off-site contact so we have a clear divide and there's no crossover there's no chain of transmission between our, our different teams there and then within the hospital and other areas and other sites we're maintaining uh, again a sequestered environment so for example our pharmacy staff only work in the pharmacy now and nobody else goes in um, uh, again to break the chain of transmission Uh, little things we use um, remote pickups now so again there's no direct uh, human to human uh, contact when either we're sending out samples um, uh, or posting drugs or owners are coming in to collect drugs and again uh, at the moment uh, we're establishing how urgent the need is and looking for other alternatives so this could be written prescriptions for use in online pharmacies or using a courier service or the post if there's no delay following um, guidelines from uh, the government about um, and post office about safe handling um, and certainly we're wiping down anything uh, that has been handled before it goes out to the practice uh, if we do see animals and we don't um, we only admitting them if absolutely necessary and then uh, they are being discharged straight back to the owner outside of the building um, in a reverse of the sort of admission procedure that I mentioned earlier and all of the subsequent discharge information is done by phone uh, and email um, and again I mentioned the use of PPE um, and this is something where practices may want to check their supplies and with increased turnover of PPE their waste disposal arrangements and um, be cognizant that uh, we might find things like eye protection masks um, and possibly even aprons or full gowns uh, are being uh, prioritized for human use this is uh, this last slide here is not really about infection control but I am aware that this is uh, the, the the shutdown and the lockdown is causing a lot of worry and stress um, both for practice staff um, as well as uh, animal owners um, who can often feel very worried and very isolated and I think practices can work can act as a source of trustworthy uh, information and support their clients and this is particularly true for uh, vulnerable clients um, we we uh, through my own clinic know of some uh, vulnerable um, people some and some elderly people now who are self-isolating alone um, and it's very important for them to know that if their pet falls sick somebody is going to look after it and so we we're using regular contact just to reassure them um, and let them know that they're not forgotten about somebody's thinking about them and then again I think um, you know we, we've talked a lot in the veterinary profession about mental health and I think this is a time when we all need to look out for each other and I think there is no uh, harm in reinforcing those messages Um, and I said earlier this is the presentation that nobody ever wants to give and uh, this is the photograph that nobody ever wants to see this was taken last Thursday um, it is a convoy of Italian army trucks um, moving bodies out of Bergamo because not only has their health system uh, become overwhelmed but also their funeral um, systems as well and 
we all have a role to play in helping to make sure that, that this uh, it doesn't happen elsewhere. And as I said earlier, it, it, we can't not see animals. Um, farm vets are going to have a very important role uh, in maintaining food supply chains, um, but also with companion animal vets, um, I include equine vets in that, um, we mustn't underestimate the importance of the companion animal bond. And I mentioned earlier, we've got a, um, a couple of elderly self-isolating clients um, and their pet is very important to them and is a great source of comfort right now. And uh, I was also in contact uh, a little over a week ago now with one of our clients who is an ICU nurse. So she's right on the front line of this. And we made sure that she had plenty of medication for her cat. And she did say that her cat was really going to help her get through, through all of this. So I think we have a role to play, um, but we need to do this as safely as possible and bear in mind uh, public health at all times. Thanks very much, Tim. Um, we're now going to, just before we move on to some questions, I'm just going to share with you a slide that we got from BCVA about biosecurity on the farm. Um, basically, it's all the same principles as what Tim said, but most of the things that Tim has discussed could, could be applied and anywhere, but were more, some of them were more specific to small animal practice. So really on the farm or, or any mixed pets or going to see horses as well, Socially distanced, I like their description of a two meters being a cow length. Um, only have the client there if absolutely necessary. Um, try and make sure there's just one person there, ensure they wear gloves. Wear gloves yourself, change them regularly. Wearing the same pair of gloves all the time is just as bad as not wearing gloves, so change them regularly. That thing that Tim said, don't touch your face, which I, I agree, it's so difficult. I think I'm touching my face more now just by trying not to. Um, if you think you may be, um, or even if you assume you may be infected with COVID-19, but you're not yet displaying symptoms, then maybe before you leave the farm or the stables or anywhere, ensure you disinfect any area you may have touched or come into contact with, as, as any area that could act as a fomite. Make sure that your PPE is, is cleaned and, and kept to, to one vet wherever possible. Wash your hands thoroughly. And the last thing, however good the, t the tea and cakes are, don't go into farmhouses, don't go into um, clients' houses, um, just keep to the area on the farm or in the stables where you need to be. So to support our colleagues across the whole veterinary team at this very difficult time for everyone, RCVF, RCVS Knowledge have published a page of resources, including veterinary advice, updates, research, evidence, it's all really useful. Thank you to everyone who's worked with us, with us to put this together and thank you for people who've donated their resources to this. And I hope you will all use this valuable resource because as in everything, knowledge and information are power and the more you know about this, the easier it is going to be to deal with it. So I'm now going to, on everybody's behalf, ask some questions that have been sent in. But before we start the questions, as Tim mentioned, there is going to be another webinar about going a little bit more deeply into infection control and biosecurity and what we all should be doing all the time and how we should be monitoring that and auditing that. So that will be coming along soon. Um, and I've, I've told you about the resources. So going on to the questions then. Um, Tim, should we wear face masks as a routine in veterinary practice? We were asked on the, on the website. Uh, generally, no. The, um, I, th I think to start with, um, face masks are very important for anybody in a healthcare setting who is dealing with infected or potentially infected patients. And from the news this morning, uh, oh, sorry, the, the current uh, uh, Public Health England advice is that people working in healthcare or nursing home settings where somebody is, is not symptomatic, does not need to wear a mask provided social distancing um, can be maintained. Uh, there, there was a news report this morning saying that that may be changing for people working in frontline healthcare settings. Um, so I think uh, vets are going to maybe find it's harder to get hold of masks 
Um, and I think we need to use these wisely because they might wind up being prioritized for human use, which is entirely correct. Um, now, uh, with my hospital, as well as others, have been donating uh, material to, um, to to local healthcare providers, which is great. Uh, we've reduced our mask use down to um, the scrubbed in surgeons only, even in our uh, in our theatre settings. Um, again, uh, uh, you know, and again, knowledge is changing, advice is changing almost on a daily basis here. But the the animal is a fomite rather than a direct infection risk unlike working with uh, a, um, uh, meeting members of, of, of the public so I, I think provided that we can stay within uh, and maintain the social distancing um, albeit there may be an instant where you're just quickly handing over a basket or uh, taking the the animal the dog away on a lead where you may be within that social social distance the the, the risk there is is very small and I think hand washing gloves social distancing are the key messages we want to get across um, if an animal has come from a covid nineteen positive household and I, 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 um, uh, and again ideally that should be a, a, a neighbor uh, or or somebody else bringing it in rather well rather the infected people who should be self-isolating um, then uh, an apron uh, might be advisable just because of the increased fomite risk there and I think I would only put a mask on if there was a real risk of uh, a, a, a splash um, or aerosol risk when when handling the animal but I think that's that that's a set of circumstances that are uh, you know, getting less and less common. So I think generally no would be the answer. Thank you. That's great. Um, Alan, can I just ask you a question that's been sent in? Um, in? In view of what you've told us about the virus, someone sent in a question. What should we use to clean practice premises, consult rooms, reception? Um, this particular practice, um, even though they're trying to keep clients out of their, um, their areas, they're in a pet shop. So there's always people walking past their reception desk, always people in the shop. So what should they be using to clean the premises? I think where we're focusing on um, the coronavirus issue, then we're lucky because of the uh, envelope. And so the um, chemicals that we use don't need to be particularly um, severe. Uh, if you look at government re recommendations around, uh, you know, people, places like old people's homes and, uh, and so on, they're just recommending uh, either detergent disinfection uh, disinfectant mixtures or um, or separately a detergent then a disinfectant um, and the, the disinfectant they just talk about being a thousand parts per million available chlorine so that's something you can use it's not um, you know you don't have to be using a, sp a specifically uh, formulated product for veterinary practice um, a lot of the bleaches and disinfectants we have in our own homes and we use to you know, clean the table or the kitchen worktops will, will probably be fine. Just check that um, if, if, you, if you're really concerned, just check the um, amount of chlorine, a thousand parts per million available chlorine. Okay, I, I'm following on from um, what, you, what Tim said about things becoming less available. So uh, we also had someone ask, if the normal disinfectant they use is out of stock, how would they know which disinfectant to use? I think it's the same thing. If you if you're worried, you know, pe people tend to choose their disinfectant for things like parvovirus, where where it's a very different issue. It's a very very resilient virus. And um, but where you where we're focusing on the on the increased um, risk of coronaviruses, then you know don't don't worry so much about veterinary licensed products. Just go with uh, um, straightforward detergents, hand washing. Um, um, uh, washing up liquid as a detergent and, and, and then either in combination or afterwards with uh, with a chlorine based disinfectant. So we don't need to panic if we can't get the um, disinfectant we normally use for in, in the face of parvo etc. But yes for coronavirus if you've got a parvo case in your practice then again yeah. you know you need to you need to think differently but if it's this this uh, routine extra disinfection that Tim's really nicely talked about around the practice or around a pet shop for example uh, then yeah, don't, don't panic if you can't get the uh, uh, the parvicidal product that you would normally use. 
And I think on our um, resources, we've got a link to um, some DEFRA information about all the different disinfectants. So that could be an interesting thing for people to look at. Um, Tim, following on from the question about face masks, some, another person has asked, sorry, I haven't got people's names, so I can't, um, but they've asked, what PPE should vets use when dealing with an animal from a suspected or confirmed COVID-19 household? Uh, I, I, I think, again, the key messages are gloves, hand washing, social distancing, um, and then also to set up a really uh, a, a plan of how to manage this beforehand. And, and that's going to be a little bit different for all practices and, might, and situations and might involve how you uh get the animal to the practice and then and then how it's handled after that now i think at an extreme end if there was no other way of getting the animal so if you had i don't know an elderly isol self-isolating person um who nobody else could help and they they had a big collapsed dog um then, then I think in that extreme set of circumstances, somebody's going to have to go into into the household, and at that point, they should probably wear um, gloves, uh, apron, or a, a, a disposable protective suit, uh, and a mask. Again, I think eye protection, so long as you don't, uh, you you maintain a social distance from the owner. Um, there's no splash risk. It, it may not be necessary, but again, goggles could be worn. And again, um, DIY type goggles that can be cleaned and disinfected are, are ideal for that. Um, I think uh, depending on who brings the animal in um, and, and the handover procedures, I think the PPE there needs to be uh, sensible. Um, I think again, if, if it's a, a neighbor, who's not showing any any clinical signs and you know if they've if you know the, the if they've been able to collect the animals safely and this could be you know um a lead being slipped out of a door and then an animal being taken that way or a cat in a basket left on the doorstep and the basket is this is is wiped and disinfected or you know if it was safe to do so um the dog being put in you know let out the front door into the garden the neighbor comes and picks it up you know there are all sorts of things that could be could be addressed so i think uh, uh, under those circumstances um I, I gloves and potentially an apron um should should be fine um uh, you might want to upgrade that if there was a, a um a, a splash or an aerosol risk but i think the biggest risk to the face there is not so much not wearing a mask it's not touching yourself so you know remembering to break that transmission because you can have as much again within reason as much um, coronavirus on your hands uh, as, as you want without being infected provided you don't transfer it to your mouth eyes or, or nose it's breaking that that touch uh, that, that hand touch um, uh, chain there okay thank you and another question um, for, uh, somebody's asked another question about a, a pet coming from a, a patient coming from a COVID-19 positive or suspected household. Should we be buffing these patients that come from, from these houses? Um, I think that's sort of a difficult one to answer. And I think the pros and cons of this need to be looked at for each individual case. Uh, I would say if it's something that can be dealt with reasonably quickly without having to admit the animal, I would probably not bath it. Um, in that I think the additional exposure to the practice, the staff, um, the risk of aerosols and splashing and so on probably outweighs any benefit that you could have from the bathing. You know, given all my comments earlier about uh, gloving, social distancing, hand washing and hand touch sites and so on. Um, I think if you were admitting the animal um, there is an argument to say well if you used a, a detergent um, a, a a, sorry detergent based shampoo on the animal you are again reducing the risk of, of, uh, of bringing any um, COVID-19 into the practice but again I think that's got to be mitigated against all the other risks in terms of contact availability of PPE availability of washing uh, facilities um, do you, does that mean you have to take the animal right way through to the back of the practice past you know all sorts of other people and and so on so i think uh 
gen generally, well, to keep it simple, generally, no. I think in certain circumstances, it may be advisable, but I think that needs to be looked at very carefully on, um, on an individual patient basis. Thank you. And obviously, sometimes emergencies are such that, uh, you know, you wouldn't want to be taking time to be bathing the animal anyway, yeah, or it wouldn't it, be appropriate. Yes, if it's, you know, if it's got... Um, it's in respiratory distress or it's got a broken leg or something I think I think you know bathing it's the last thing you want to be doing. Okay um, and then another um, question this um, with this person says I change my clothes and wash my hands before leaving work shower when I get home and launder my uniform is that enough what temperature is needed to kill COVID so I'll ask you that for a bit first sorry I change my clothes and wash my hands before leaving work shower when I get home and launder my uniform is this is this enough? Yes. <laughs> Generally. Um, what about should they be laundering their uniform at home, or, or would that be better? Better leaving the uniform at work and it being laundered there. I, th I think if there are laundry, laundry facilities at work, it would be better to uh, to leave them at work, and you're just breaking any, any risk uh, uh, that there is. You just—it's all about breaking chains. It's about building firewalls wherever possible and, and, and stopping that chain of transmission. Um, so I think if that's possible, then that, that's ideal. If it isn't, um, then, you know, the usual infection control um, measures apply, which is, you know, securely bag a, any clothing um, uh, before taking it home and then straight into the, uh, the washing machine. And, and I think the government, the, the, the Public Health England uh, advises wash with plenty of detergent at the hottest temperature appropriate for the fabric. Thank you, because that answers the next question then, which was what temperature is needed to kill COVID on clothes and is a 30 degree fast wash sufficient? So I think you've just answered that, haven't you? Just as hot as you can be. So Alan might want to comment on that one. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I have to confess, I'm not an expert on washing clothes, but again, I think it's good to go, always go back to the highest level of advice you can, uh, PHE um, and the NHS have a lot of a lot of good information for people who are working in you know, people's homes or working in social care and visiting people who are isolating because they've got COVID signs, uh, and that's what they recommend for those people. You know, in your washing machine, uh, at the hot, hottest temperature, the clothes will uh, are recommended um, with, with an appropriate amount of. Detergent, and again, it's uh, it's a virus. It has an envelope. The, it's the detergent that's really there um, that, that will kill the virus. But just as we wash our hands with warm soapy water, not cold soapy water, it makes sense to use the hottest temperature that it clothes will tolerate. And you mentioned P PHE there, Alan. That's Public Health England, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Other sites do exist, but I mean, I I'm in England, so I tend to <laughs> I tend to go I tend to go there to. Uh, uh, to, to see what they're saying about people. Obviously, they're not they're not giving specific information for vets, but there is a lot of information about people who are working in similar settings, probably at a higher risk because they're mixing regularly with people who are self isolating with, with signs. And I think it, I think you can quite sensibly translate a lot of their um, information into uh, day to day veterinary practice. Excellent, and I think we'll try and get a link to that. Is there equivalent in Scotland? You know. Um... Yeah, I just echo Alan's comments there. There's the NHS Inform site in Scotland. Uh, it's really useful. It's got a, a load of information, um, and you can you can click and follow the links to to the documents very very easily. And a lot of the information that's directed towards patient care, um, but but also health care in other healthcare. Uh, and social care settings is directly applicable to to veterinary practice. Brilliant. I'm sure there must be equivalents in the other developing Wales and the devolved government and and in Northern Ireland. Um, and we'll we'll see if we can find links to those. Um, so one question. We'll finish with one question now, uh, um, which is: Should staff still be travelling between branches in a multi-branch practice? Uh, I I would say wherever possible, no. Um, because if if you have a multi-branch practice, that's a good example of how you can sequester a team to that practice so they don't overlap anywhere else. And it's 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 all about breaking the, uh, the, the this potential chain of transmission. Um, now, again, as people fall ill, p 
people, you know, these arrangements may have to change, but I would say wherever possible, uh, no. There's a, there was a really good podcast on the BBC a couple of days ago where they lined up a series of matches and set one alight and then that one lit match set all the others alight and then about halfway down the chain they had one match that was just pulled halfway down um, and and it's the you know they were using this as a metaphor for virus spread and it stopped at that point so I think this is where you know the, the using these non-overlapping teams can just help break break any potential transmission risk. Thank you. Would you agree with that, Alan? It's got nothing. Okay, well... Um, yes, I would. Sorry, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry Alan. <laughs> sorry. Well, a horrible, horrible moment there. I thought you were going to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, thank you both very, very much. That's been so useful. I've, I've learned an awful lot and I think it's made me feel a little bit more confident. I mean, the problem with these times we live in is that there's very few certainties. Everything changes day to day, but I think having information is the key to, to um, trying to find, know what the best thing to do is. So, so thank you. You've been absolutely brilliant, both of you. And I hope that we've, we've helped um, or everyone listening to, to have a bit more understanding. And please do go and have a look at the resources because they're there to help you. Um, so, so please go on there and have a look and we're hoping to keep on adding to them. And thank you again for the people who've, who've helped us with that. Um, just stay safe, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>